It is Tuesday, April the 7th, and welcome back to Goodfellows, a Hoover Institution broadcast examining the economic, societal, and geostrategic concerns in a world changed by and ever-changing due to an unprecedented global pandemic. I'm Bill Whalen, a Hoover Institution Research Fellow, as well as the Virginia Hobbs Carpenter Fellow in Journalism. And it is my great honor today to introduce three Hoover Senior Fellows, three good fellows, if you will. We're going to share their thoughts, not just on the news of the day, but what to expect in the days, weeks, and months coming ahead as society tries to adjust to a world that hopefully we can get back to normal. The good fellows are John Cochran, an economist, the Rose Marie Anderson, Jack Anderson, Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution, and the author of the Grumpy Economist blog. John, how are you today? Uh, I'm, uh, I don't have the coronavirus yet, so I'm doing great. Good. Stay healthy, my friend. We're also joined by Neil Ferguson, the Milbank Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution, a celebrated author and historian, and just recently the host of Neil Ferguson's Networld, a three-part PBS series on the intersection of social media technology and the spread of cultural movements, those of you who are looking for smart, witty, can't put it down, intelligent binge watches, get rid of the Tiger King, pick up Neil Ferguson. Neil, how are you today? I'm very well, thanks, Bill. And like John, I'm in the happy position of, of, of not yet having COVID-19, or possibly I, I had it and didn't know, um, or perhaps possibly I will have it, but I'm in one of those states that is relatively comfortable. Okay, we're two for two in the health front. Let's see if we can go three for three. Last but certainly not least, we're also joined by Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster, the Fawad and Michelle Ajami Senior Fellow here at the Hoover Institution, and before coming to California, the National Security Advisor to the President of the United States. H.R., are you likewise healthy? I, I am, Bill, and it's great to be with you and, and our colleagues here. Terrific. John, I'd like to start this conversation by referring you to an article that appeared in the Washington Post over the weekend, the headline of which was, once again, government is caught unprepared. And I'd like to direct you to the quote that appeared at the end of this article, the premise of this article, by the way, in 2005, then President George W. Bush reads a book on the uh, influenza strain of 1918. He is horrified. He decides the time has come for a national pandemic strategy from the federal government. He wants that to happen. Fast forward 15 years later, and it would seem the federal government has been caught flat-footed by the COVID-19 virus. And this article examines why it is the government was caught flat-footed. And here's the quote I'd like you three to discuss. It comes from Tom Ridge, who was a former governor of Pennsylvania, as well as the first secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. And he said, and I quote, I've often wondered if democracy writ large is designed to be responsive rather than preemptive. One of the lessons perhaps as a result of this is we'll be a little more inclined to be preemptive. With election cycles every two years, there is not a lot of credence given to people who take a longer view. This seems an easy shot to take at government, but I wonder if this is also an indictment on our society. I think of people who don't save money, who don't necessarily keep their pantry stocked, who don't go to doctors for checkups. Uh, HR, you've served inside the belly of the beast of government. Uh, Secretary Ridge, write about government and take it into a larger look at society. I think he's right about it, Bill. And, and I think he's right about it because of, of maybe our cultural pre, uh, predilection toward, you know, toward uh, short-termism you know, and, and activity over really thinking clearly about how those activities equate to progress, or in this case, greater security for, from a health uh, perspective and, and preparation for a pandemic. And when I went into the, to the White House in February of 2017, I recognized this phenomenon that we were captured in large measure by the day-to-day, -day, and we didn't have in place really clearly defined, well-thought-out strategies. And this is why we we, we started a new position, a Deputy National Security Advisor for Strategy, to carve out really a separate process to think longer term. And, and we prioritized those efforts by identifying 16 first order challenges to national security and prosperity and, and American influence in, in the world. And one of those was the, the ability to respond to a, a large scale health crisis, either a man-made one uh, or, or a natural pandemic. And what this really just goes to show is that really, you know, no strategy is worth a damn unless it gets implemented, right? And, and so there are strategies that go back, as you mentioned, to the, to the George W. Bush uh, administration. And we identified really three priority tasks that we had to accomplish in the strategy. The first was global surveillance and the ability to identify and then control epidemics closer to the source. Of course, this was foiled by the dishonesty and, 
and, uh, and lack of transparency, uh, deception of the Chinese Communist Party. Once the, once the pandemic is loose, though, and an epidemic is loose that we have to respond to, we have to be able to mobilize resources. And this is, you know, the, you saw the personal protective equipment, but obviously the therapeutic drugs uh, and, and, uh, and, and the, the hardware of healthcare, uh, in, in this case, ventilators, but also the people, be able to mobilize people in, in response to control the pandemic and, and to, uh, uh, to, to, to mitigate uh, its effects such that it, it's manageable. And you've seen all the areas that we've fallen short in, in, the, in this area and the scramble to make up uh, for lost time and for, and for the lack of, of preparation. And the third party task was to innovate, to make sure we removed barriers to innovation uh, with it, within our economy uh, and, and, uh, and especially in the biomedical field to be able to create therapeutics quickly and then obviously to, to, to innovate in the area of, of rapid prototyping of vaccines. So I think in, in, the, in the first area, we were foiled by the Chinese Communist Party. In the second area, we were plagued, if, if, you'll, if you'll pardon the ex- expression, uh, by, by, uh, by bureaucratic inertia and inadequate uh, preparation. Uh, and, and in the third area, I think we might be doing okay. I, think, I, mean, I think that, we're, uh, that, that what we're seeing is, as, as John Cochran mentioned uh, last session, you're seeing inadequacies in, in sort of our centralized government approach to problems but you're also seeing a great deal of innovation and initiative uh, in, in local government and, and then also, um, but then also in the private sector. And I think you're seeing the federal government catch up these days. And we could talk more about that if you'd like as well. Okay. Neil, John, go ahead, jump in. Well, I think it's worth remembering that the United States has quite a track record of uh, missing impending disaster and then having to improvise the response going all the way back to Pearl Harbor. And I vividly remember the conversations that went on after 9-11 about missed threats by Al-Qaeda. So this isn't the first time we've uh, said we were prepared, but but weren't really. It's worth contextualizing this globally, though, that there were plenty of democracies that got it right uh, in Asia, Taiwan got it right, had an extremely effective response uh, involving testing and contact tracing. South Korea also did very well and uh, has shown that you can uh, get an outbreak under control once they they had one very quickly indeed. So let's not make the mistake of thinking that this is uh, a problem of democracy. A bunch of democracies have done extremely well. They just happen to be democracies that learnt the lessons of SARS and MERS uh, diseases which didn't really impact the Western world and therefore we didn't really pay enough attention. We mostly thought we were going to be up against um, another influenza. And remember, that was the, the, the book that George W. Bush had been reading, a book about the great influenza pandemic uh, of 1918-19. I just read an extremely good detailed account of what went wrong in Britain. And it's very similar, actually, because uh, most people in uh, the UK government were well aware of the threat of a, of a pandemic, but they were quite focused on an influenza pandemic. Uh, that was the scenario they had in mind. And while it's clear that Boris Johnson left it much too late to uh, press the panic button, so late that he himself is now in intensive care with COVID-19, mm-hmm. it wasn't all his fault because his scientific advisors, whom he was regularly consulting, from January through February into March, into mid-March, uh, were tending to play down the, the threat, or at least arguing against uh, a lockdown of the sort that we now realize we need to contain this very contagious virus. So I think it's, it's not just that the US federal government failed. Other democratic governments failed. Not only Britain, but other European governments uh, did badly. Uh, but some democratic governments did pretty well. And, and those were the ones in East Asia that had learned the right lessons from, from SARS and MERS. Mm-hmm. That's where I think, uh, <clears throat> in some sense, we're lucky uh, that this uh, virus is just bad enough to give us a good dry run for the really bad ones to come. Uh, I mean, if you look at what cholera did when it came through, it's way worse than this. Uh, the U.S., like most other countries, uh, needs a wake-up call. <laughs> and we, uh, the, uh, as, as uh, both of you guys have pointed out, uh, the East Asian countries learned their lesson from SARS and were ready to go. Uh, yes, this happens. I think we were unprepared for the Civil War. Uh, we were unprepared for terrorism. We were unprepared for hurricanes. 
Uh, but then we learned our lesson. Uh, Bush, the Bush administration wrote a nice report on what we should do. It's, it's, it's fun reading. And then it went and sat on, uh, you know, the last scene from Raiders of the Lost Ark where there's a huge uh, warehouse. warehouse and everything sits there forever. Uh, the Obama administration updated it. There's a really snazzy reports with charts and graphs and recommendations. And that went back on the shelf too. Um, it is, however, I think we're paying too much attention to top level presidential leadership here. Um, fighting this sort of thing really is in the, in the lower levels of the systemic bureaucracy. Uh, and that's where we depend on competence. Uh, and I think that's where we saw a pretty shocking lack of competence and preparedness. You know, we learned after 9-11, we had great police departments and, and great um, fire departments and they didn't know each other's phone numbers. Uh, the military writes great plans. I hope I don't get this wrong, HR. But uh, you know you got to write great plans, and then you go run war games, and then you find out that the guys in the tanks don't know how to talk to the guys in the airplanes, and they're shooting at the wrong place, and then you get it straight. So uh, you cannot ask bureaucracies to innovate at the last moment. Uh, you, you need to get these things practiced and worked out, and that certainly did not uh, happen. There were these beautiful reports that then everyone uh, just put on the shelf. And I do think that's a lesson worth exploring here. This sort of uh, shockingly bad, the shockingly bad state of our uh, bureaucratic responses, uh, not just the president not waking up in time to, to do things, but um, the, the CDC and the SNAFU with the test kits, the FDA and all the regulations it had against getting things to happen. The continuing, you know, why didn't anybody in January think we might need to order some masks and ventilators? Uh, we see that on the economic front, which is a little more my bailiwick. Uh, Congress decreed that uh, unemployment insurance shall be available to all. Well, it turns out that the state unemployment offices aren't capable of handling a huge rush of applications. The Small Business Administration wants money to go out the front door. Well, there's forms to fill out, procedures to follow. Everybody's afraid of getting uh, sued. Uh, it, it's going to be months before that happens. Um, our... our there's, there's a failure. We don't operate on, on, on the system of the grand leader who decrees things. There's supposed to be competent bureaucracies. And those bureaucracies have to have well worked out plans. Uh, it's very, very hard as we're discovering in the economic area to ask them to innovate at the last moment. So I do hope that's the lesson going forward that um, we need to not just write a big report and say, well, that was nice. Uh, we, we need to actually uh, have these plans war gamed and worked out. And as a last thought, um, I'm worried about this going forward. The next step of this has to be, all our governments have been able to do is finally a, a, a top level leader says, everyone go home, stop, go home. Well, that's nice, but that is not what the East Asian countries did. The way the East Asian, the way you have to fight this before technology comes to save us you have to fight this with a quite detailed and intrusive system of uh, testing, lockdowns of areas, forcing people to stay home who, are, who should be quarantined. Uh, this is hard stuff. This requires a competent, low-level bureaucracy. And we're not, they're not even starting to think about writing the plans and the war games for how we're going to do it. Well, I'd just like to make a couple of comments on, on, on both of your remarks. I mean, first of all, you know, I think what this, what this crisis shows us is the importance of history and, and understanding how you know, past experience relates to potential future dangers. And I think one of the problems that we have is some, it's hard to generate empathy for future generations who will c confront what John has said is maybe an even bigger crisis to come. But a way to do that is to understand historical experience and understand the importance, therefore, of, of preparing for these sorts of eventualities and to create a mentality of, you know, what, what, you, what you will do the Monday after this crisis begins, well, let's think about instead of doing it then, doing, preparing, preparing better now for those eventualities. But HR, if I could, um, so you, you're the expert on this. So the military has learned the lesson, don't fight the last war. Don't have a, you know, <laughs> the plans in 1914, which were ready to redo 1870, the Maginot Line, well, that's going to stop Hitler. Uh, I know our military is quite good, knows this danger yeah. and uh, tries to reach out and think what's the next. And when the next one comes unexpectedly, as terrorism did, was very quick at 
figuring out the lessons that works and institutionalizing them at the at the much at you know at the battalion at the much lower level. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe maybe you should tell us how that should be running to get this lower level cool. of bureaucracy tuned to today's problem fast, and then not not then with the next one is a flu or if the next one is a bloodborne disease, we're not well. We're ready for COVID nineteen, and but we got something else. Well, I think what you learn from, from military history is that the militaries who have the greatest difficulty at the beginning of a war are those that studied the last war only superficially. And this is, I think, is what Neil was getting to with, with SARS, right? SARS should have revealed to us you know, the danger and the immediacy of, of this problem, but you know, it went away too fast for us to really learn the hard lessons. But if we had studied it, if we had really studied it, and to your point as well, right? I mean, it's, it's about implementation, right? And the military can implement because it has all the levers at its disposal to conduct military operations. We're decentralized, and we don't have many of these civilian equivalents, especially, as you mentioned, to integrate efforts across communities, across states, to be able to shift resources nat nationally. And so I think what we may conclude on the back end of this is that we need something like a civilian reserve corps where we, of course, we have the technology, we have the capability now to inventory skill sets among potential volunteers, to be able to move people to crises who understand how to deal with them. And, you know, what are the competencies we need? Of course, we know we need the medical competencies to deal with this, but doctors and nurses, what do they do? They care for patients. You need leaders who understand how to integrate people uh, into, into a system, whether it's the Javits Center in, in New York, or whether it's getting ahead of a wave of this kind of crisis, like we're seeing now in Louisiana and in Detroit. And these are people who have skill sets that are not just, not just medical, but these are people who know how to cope with crises. They know how to build teams on the fly. They know how to break down bureaucratic barriers and, and integrate efforts ac across agencies. They understand complex supply chains and how to get them into place, right? I mean, I think there's this tendency at times in Washington to think if you write it on paper, it's gonna happen, right? So you need people with operational experience who understand how to make things happen on the ground to match people and resources and provide people with the purpose, the motivation, the direction to get it done. You know, so, so I think that that's the skill set we have, luckily. I mean, you know, I've been involved in the last couple of weeks and playing a small role in mobilizing some of the people with these skill sets, right? These are recently retired flag officers, you know, general officers and admirals who are, were in the medical profession. And guess what they did? They, de they dealt with crises in, in military hospitals, in Balad, or the, the commander of Lonstool Medical Center at the height of the Afghan and, and the, the Iraq wars. These are people who understand how to, how to get things done uh, and, and to do so, especially from a healthcare perspective. You see many of, of, of these leaders with these skill sets, like in Washington State, in New York. These are people who have these backgrounds. We need people with not just those military backgrounds, but also the civilian equivalents. And we need to be able to mobilize them in times of, of crises. So this, this might be, I think, a, you know, a concrete, you know, we got to get through this crisis first and do everything we can to support, you know, the, the, the frontline troops in this, which are the, you know, the, the nurses and, and doctors and first responders. But it's not, too, it's not too soon, I don't think, to be here and saying, okay, how do we organize to get to the how? How do you get it done? Okay, because the, the you, challenge, you know, uh, challenge is not just medical. I mean, I'm, I'm always going to come back to the economics. The huge challenge we face right now is how do you fight uh, the not the medical part, but the transmission of a disease without destroying an economy. Mm -hmm. uh, now that that takes understanding, you know, the guy who can go down to the auto body shop and say, okay, you guys need to put masks on and stand six feet from each other, but we can keep this thing going. We're going to have uh, travel restrictions. Oh boy, how do you, you know, somebody has to sit there and decide who gets to travel where and who doesn't get to travel where. Uh, you know, we're already having that at a state level. It's chaos if it's not. Uh, thought through, but it's not just a health issue and it's not a military issue. It's one that's really, that is our challenge. How do you restrict people's movements and interaction without destroying an economy? Right. A couple of thoughts prompted by this exchange. Uh, I completely agree, HR, that, that having people in, in the policy world who are attuned to history is tremendously important. Uh, I was kind of touched to find that George W. Bush had had time to read Barry's book on 1918-19. I wonder what the last history book 
uh, President Trump read was. I, I think history is extraordinary here because we, we just don't live long enough as individuals to experience Black Swan or, uh, you know, Dragon King events, these very rare big uh, uh, once a century shocks. Uh, if we just rely on our lived experience, we're never going to see them coming. And, and I think history is about getting people aware of the possibility of a catastrophic global pandemic. You, you, you actually get a better handle on that by reading about what happened in the US in 1918-19 than you do by watching the movie Contagion. Somehow watching science fiction versions just inclines us to assume that this belongs in the realm of science fiction. History tells us that it's real and it can happen to real people in real time. But there's another piece that we've been missing uh, in governments and that, that's network science. Fundamentally, uh, network science is a way of thinking about a contagion in any domain, whether it's a digital virus or a biological virus. And the people who were working at Northeastern, people like Lashlo Barabasi, uh, on these issues uh, had uh, done some lovely work showing that effectively the United States was as close to China as any other country in terms of effective distance and integration into the network of, of travel, of air travel in particular. And so the U.S. should have been on high alert, uh, as high really as, as, as Taiwan or, or Singapore uh, or South Korea, when the news of this virus broke, because any virus in China was going to get to the United States as fast as to anywhere in the world because of the very much higher level of connectedness that we have with China, even compared with uh, 10 years ago. So I, I think one important field that's been missing from a lot of the discussion, uh, even uh, in the last few weeks, has been network science. We hear from the epidemiologists and we're beginning to get a little bit skeptical about some of the models that they, they use. Uh, but, you know, you need to have a, a, at least some people who understand networks to see just how vulnerable we are and to see what you have to do until the vaccine comes along. We know that some, at some point, let's say 18 months from now, there probably will be a widely available vaccine for COVID-19. But until then, historic, history and network science tells you that all that will work will be social distancing. Um, and the question, this comes to, to John's point, the question is how much social distancing, how much lockdown is the right amount to contain the virus, to so-called uh, flatten the curve without cratering the economy? And I don't think we've actually been asking the right people that question because an epidemiologist will tell you, oh, if you don't do what we say, 30 million people worldwide will die. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there'll be some economic costs to that, but we, we're not paid to think about those. But somebody has to do a cost-benefit analysis. And I think, John, in your recent uh, blog posts, you've been doing some really interesting thinking about what the economy looks like over two years and maybe beyond two years when a whole bunch of activities really have to be discontinued or radically altered. I think we should talk about that because the economics of lockdown seem pretty much like the economics of Great Depression. And I don't think they're sustainable for more than a matter of, of weeks without ruinous consequences. But let me, let me put in a positive note from your own uh, network analysis. Um, I'm sure you've been amused as I have to watch those fun simulations where you see little balls run into each other and diseases spread and how utterly unrealistic that is, because uh, one of those little balls flies on a plane and goes and starts something else. It's not people running into each other at random. That's the network point. Yeah. The other point is that there's one of those little balls that infects 100, and most of them infect 0.2 and are, are irrelevant. So one of the things I've been thinking about is, is the wide dispersion in this, in this transmission rate, and what networks point us to is the pathways of transmission rate. That is an enormously hopeful thing for our project of how do you tamp this down without destroying the economy. Uh, the lockdown just stops everything, but you only have to stop the plane. You only have to stop the church meeting where uh, 50 people are in a hot room together uh, for an afternoon and, and you do an enormous amount of good. Uh, stopping every activity is just extremely expensive. The fact that there are pathways and particular things that are contributing to most of the problem, if you do it intelligently, if you've got the information, if you've got the ability to do things in detail and not just get on your palace steps and say, stop everything, uh, I think that's a, that's, that is the way to let the economy go and slow this thing down in a cost-efficient way. Mm -hmm. 
I think what's well, Neil Ferguson question for you. Um, interesting, interesting video out of England this weekend. Your former queen took to the airwaves, uh, gave a five minute address, which has been universally hailed as wonderfully soothing. And if you read her remarks, look at her remarks, she actually gave a very clever speech. She invoked British greatness. She invoked 1940. Uh, there is a not so subtle reference to Vera Lind at the end of it. Um, Here's the question, Neil, though. First of all, what is going on in your former country right now when you have the Queen offering comfort and solace? You have the Prime Minister maybe fighting for his life right now. Brexit um, up in who knows where Brexit is right now. Talk a bit about Britain, Neil, then let's take this into Europe. Is there going to be a wave of nationalism coming forth? Because if you talk about pandemics, you're ultimately talking about who comes to a country and who doesn't, which gets into the border issues. And then HR, I think maybe that's a good segue then to get into China and the question of who is really leading in this world right now. So Neil, talk about the UK situation. Well, as a dual citizen, um, of the United States and the United Kingdom, I suppose I should say that she's not my former queen. She's still oh, your queen. <laughs> very much the queen. Uh, and I watched her broadcast and made our two young sons watch it too. Uh, it was as always an impressive performance, uh, uh, reminding us just uh, what a great benefit there can be in having a non-elected head of state, uh, not subject to the democratic uh, process, uh, you see, I'm a monarchist at heart. What, what was fascinating about the Queen's uh, address to the nation and the Commonwealth uh, was that she emphasized the, the connection with World War II. Uh, she reminded us that her first broadcast to the nation had been in 1940, hinting, I think, that that was worse. And I think it, it was a lot worse. I mean, just in terms of uh, the likely ultimate fatality rate, this ain't World War II. Um, and the uh, we'll meet again punchline was uh, was a very nicely executed move. But we didn't realize as we were watching why she'd done it. Uh, this this was a very carefully crafted me message of reassurance uh, based on the knowledge that the prime minister was in fact quite seriously ill uh, right. and would in fact have to go into hospital. Uh, if you are in intensive care on, uh, uh, on an ICU, uh, you are actually in grave danger. The statistics show that uh, according to the National Health Service in the UK, you've got a 50-50 chance if you end up in that situation. I'm mm -hmm. told that Boris Johnson's situation is better than that, and he probably wouldn't be in intensive care if he weren't the Prime Minister. So I don't think his chances are quite as bad as 50-50. Still, it's a major political crisis uh, that's been uh, unleashed by this. And as I mentioned earlier, you can trace it back to insouciance at a crucial moment. While the experts were quite hesitant to tell the prime minister how bad things were, he was carrying on meeting uh, and indeed making a great show of shaking hands uh, at a time when London was rife with the virus. Mm -hmm. Brexit has been entirely driven from people's minds by this uh, crisis uh, to, to, to a remarkable extent. Although it was largely a finished process, uh, politically by the time COVID-19 came along. Remember, it's not that long ago that we were celebrating Boris Johnson's extraordinary election victory just in December. Uh, he seemed to bestride the political uh, stage unassailably. Uh, now he's uh, in hospital, a rather unsatisfactory or unexpected deputy Dominic Raab is in his shoes, and the Labour Party has just elected a new and thoroughly credible leader uh, in Keir Starmer. So British politics has been thrown into turmoil. Britain will not be the only country that is thrown into political turmoil by COVID-19. Uh, you asked a uh, bill about Europe. Yes. And this brings me back to Brexit. Uh, on a day when the German government has essentially closed the German border to all but essential people crossing it, I think we are reminded of how grave a threat to the European project the pandemic is. In the crisis, the Italians found that they could not even depend on their fellow European Union members for uh, emergency medical supplies. There was a ghastly moment a couple of weeks ago when it seemed that the German government was actually going to stop those supplies going to Italy. Uh, they had to change their tack. But I think 
the crisis is exposing all kinds of fissures within the European Union. And these won't be forgotten after the pandemic has uh, burnt itself out or, or been contained, least of all by, by Italians. My, my own sense is that, uh, just take, taking a step back, one of the lessons of history is that large entities, be they empires or uh, confederal entities like the European Union, have all kinds of economies of scale when everything's going fine and the network uh, effects are positive. But when something like uh, this virus comes along, SARS-CoV-2, then there are terrible diseconomies of scale and negative externalities from having a giant, uh, very efficient network. This is what the Romans discovered when they were struck uh, by infectious uh, disease. Uh, it was a feature of uh, the 14th century that city-states were actually better placed to cope with the plague uh, than big sprawling kingdoms. And I think in our time, what's really striking about the last few weeks and months, the big entities, China, the European Union, the United States, have actually done badly. And it's been little, nimble, well-defended entities like Taiwan and Israel that have come top of the league table of countries that coped well with the pandemic. So we're kind of heading back to city-states where small is beautiful. Unless the US federal government can get its act together, uh, a lot of states are going to be saying to themselves, heck, we can't rely on those guys in Washington. We better make sure we have a good state-level plan in place for the next pandemic. i follow up on that just a little. Um, so there is, in time of crisis, sort of a wave of we're in this together, mm -hmm. a wave of patriotism, uh, and, and, uh, and that's important. It's important as it starts to fray. We are all being asked to do stuff that's pretty unreasonable for uh, the greater good. Um, and that lasts. It... it needs people to believe that the elites in charge are vaguely competent. Now, we'll put up with a lot of snafu and fubar as we did in the Second World War, but uh, they need to believe that people in charge roughly know what they're doing. And I think the lesson of the last 10 years of our politics was large amounts on the right and the left uh, really losing faith in, in the competence of those in charge uh, at the leader level, and now I think revealed also at the bureaucratic level. Um, so that, that appeal may not last. Um, and, and as months go by, and if people are being asked to do things that are clearly nonsense, uh, to stop activities that could go on even when you know, their life savings are being thrown down the toilet of the business they've worked forever is being shuttered completely needlessly. Uh, their willingness to chip in and support the queen and country and, and do things patriotically will, uh, will fray. And I think uh, Neil's right. That will lead to interesting uh, politics on the other end. Uh, the local versus national one. I was going to ask Neil, so you think the U.S. Uh, is a bad idea <laughs> in these times? Uh, you know, and we've, we've thought of federalism as a good idea. Uh, but I do think, uh, you know, that kind of thing is coming. Already uh, some states... Uh, I saw that the governor of Rhode Island didn't want New Yorkers driving into her state. I know that um, uh, places with a lot of vacation homes have said, uh, the Lake Tahoe areas have said, San Franciscans, stay home. We don't want you. Uh, bring your money in the summer when it's all done. Uh, so that, that does undermine the, uh, the national coordination that we said is in some way needed. If, if you start everybody fighting for yourself, you're, we're seeing that now. We won't export masks. And yet we expect the Canadians to export to us the paper that makes masks. Uh, we won't, you know, in, and we want to buy from India the ingredients to do reagents, but we don't want to export to them uh, other stuff. Uh, the, the, this is actually something that needs international cooperation uh, and interstate cooperation. And, and simply going to a nationalistic uh, answer to things is a dangerous outcome. Well, I would just say, too, that I don't think we could pull it off competently, right, <laughs> to centralize everything. So, I mean, an answer to central government, you know, lack of competence and preparation is not more centralization, right? So I think what, what the, the question that maybe we can work on at Hoover here together and, and with our colleagues elsewhere is, is how do we turn what in, 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 this, in this crisis has appeared to be disadvantages associated with our decentralization into advantages. And I think there are some simple answers to that already that have to be fleshed out. I mean, what is just better coordination? Another is better visibility. Another is better ability to move resources, material and people, 
to problems as problems like this move across the country in sort of a wave of fashion. So I, I just think the answer is not centralization. I don't think an appro- Singapore's approach is probably not scalable you know, in the United States. Uh, and, and, and we probably ought not to adopt that as the solution. So I, I think the question we ought to ask ourselves is, what, how do we turn perceived vulnerabilities in our decentralized free market, uh, federal uh, democratic system, how do we turn those into, into strengths? And I think if we think about that, we, we can do that. And we can be effective. And, and of course, you're still going to need you know, sort of, uh, capabilities that are centralized. From a defense perspective, I would say, hey, you know, it's time now to change the National Guard, right? I mean, the National Guard ought to have the capabilities within it to respond not just to this crisis, but other crises like hurricanes and, 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 and fires and so forth. Still, and still have deployable military capabilities for overseas, I mean, why are there combat units in the Guard instead of in the Army Reserve, you know, for example? That doesn't make sense, I don't think, anymore. So I think there are some big structural things we can do at the federal level. And, but I, I think to go back to, to Neil's comments on networks, I think the, the work that you've done on networks, I think therein lies not only a better understanding of the problem, as you've laid out, Neil, but also some of the critical elements to the solution. So one of these working groups that I've joined, which is a very just a small, I'm playing a very small role in it as an advisor, but what it's done is it's brought together doctors and epidemiologists, uh, and, and, but also uh, doctors who've run these responses to, to crises, uh, data managers, um, uh, executive recruiting firms, and, 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 and the, the, they've developed a private sector kind of solution to identifying where the greatest gaps are in competencies associated with response to this crisis and how to fill those gaps with volunteers. And they're using networks to contact those who they know, but then they're also using you know, electronic networks to reach out to volunteers. And they're using the databases and, and artificial intelligence type technologies to match you know, to match uh, you know, p- people like respiratory therapists, you know, uh, who have people who have these skill sets. And then, then they're also, because these are influential people who are well-connected, they're lobbying state governments to relax licensure requirements so that these volunteers can actually get there and do some good. So I, I, I'm, I, I see, Neil and, and, and John, an, an element uh, of the solution in, in the decentralization of our system. I don't think we want to centralize it. Uh, and then, Neil, also I see in, in your scholarship and the work you've done on networks, uh, really a, a big part of the solution. If we, can, if we can figure out, again, how to get to implementation, right, how to use you know, these kind of networks uh, in a way that actually gets the job done at the local level. But Neil touched on something very deep, which I, I want to highlight. Uh, it, the, the decadence in, in the Ross Duthat meaning of the word of our large federal countries, our, the European Union, of our intergovernment, the, the United Nations and all its uh, various things, as opposed to smaller scale. In economic policy, uh, I've, I've been interested to see how small countries, the, the Nordic countries, New Zealand, are able to just handle competent reforms. If their tax system is screwed up, they're able to fix it. If their social security system is, is not working, they're able to fix it. Uh, where the US is just completely unable to fix most of the obvious things. The European Union, um, you know, in, in its organization, the Brussels bureaucracy is exactly why Brexit might have been a good idea after all, uh, completely unable to, to work on these kinds of things. So um, the, the de- the, it's not just size, there's a decadence in these large, uh, large countries and large supranational organizations, which is showing up in the yeah. context of virus, but I think was a, a problem of our democratic system, um, that, that a long festering problem shown uh, in, in, in stark relief now. I think it's important that when we come to, to write the history of, of this crisis, we recognize that this wasn't a failure of an individual president half so much as it was the failure of the administrative state or what people sometimes call the deep state, but I think administrative state's a better description, that the federal government with its, what, 60 plus agencies uh, uh, has in fact been exposed as unwieldy, uh, slow moving with, as uh, HR said, immense inertia where it most needed to be nimble. And I think the the real lesson of this is, is made clear when you compare 
the response of the uh, federal government in 1957-58 to a great influenza pandemic. It was uh, allowed to call it uh, by its real name then. So it was uh, either the Hong Kong flu or the Asian flu. Uh, uh, get this, um, Eisenhower was then president, uh, uh, appreciated the severity of the crisis. Uh, CDC existed then too, and it saw an opportunity to prove itself. Eisenhower made a request to Congress for $2.5 million to expedite research on, on vaccines. And every effort went into accelerating the creation of a, a, va a vaccine. This was the same federal government that, of course, had built the interstate highways. I think if you look back at that time, it's hard not to be struck by how good the federal government was as, as, a, as a government then, as a state. And, and of course, the people running it had fought their way through World War II. They, they confronted organi organizational challenges and threats far greater than, and, than a mere virus. Uh, the contrast between the documents from that time that I've been reading this week and the documents from our own time that I've been reading, it, it, it's heartbreaking. You realize how far we've fallen, how much we've sunk. And also, I'll add another maybe somewhat controversial point. The Americans of 1957-58 and their British counterparts regarded inf infectious disease as part of life. Uh, it, was, it was just one of the risks you encountered. Polio hadn't been eradicated. Smallpox hadn't been eradicated. The world was full of infectious diseases. And most people had some memory of a family member having had their life cut short. We have become so fantastically risk averse uh, that once we start talking about hundreds of deaths, before it's even been established clearly, that there's going to be excess mortality, which was the term they used back in the late 50s, before we even know if there's going to be excess mortality in the months of March and April 2020, we've shut our economy down completely. There was no closure of schools, there was no social distancing, there were no lockdowns in 57, 58. There was an acceptance that there was going to be elevated mortality and not just of the elderly. So the contrast between that America and this America, not just in terms of government competence, but in terms of the attitudes of ordinary people is very striking indeed. But the the, the I would just danger here in getting too romantic not. about small level stuff, because of course the one thing more incompetent than the federal deep state bureaucracy is the state and local uh, bureaucracy. I mean, heaven forbid we put the people running the state of California uh, bureaucracies in charge of things. They, they're 10 times worse than the federal. Well, I would just, can I just maybe on a positive note, <laughs> talk, talk about really a uh, draw contrast with Brussels and, and our system here. I, I think the strength of our system is is that our, our government officials are accountable to the people. And it's really up to us, right? It's up to the people uh, to, to demand better leadership and more effective government. And we have the opportunity to do so. That opportunity doesn't exist in China. That opportunity doesn't, doesn't really exist really with the bureaucrats in Brussels from an EU perspective. So I think really what this, what, what this crisis shows to some, met, and to some degree is the importance of sovereignty resting with the people, which was the radical idea of the revolution and why we don't have a queen anymore, Neil. <laughs> is, but also, is it just, the radical idea behind Brexit and perhaps one of the tragedies of 2020 is that uh, having uh, more or less achieved Brexit and certainly having ended the debate uh, on whether Britain should uh, leave the EU or, or not. Boris Johnson has been struck down really before it was possible to reconfigure the British state to take advantage of its new separate status. And I, I think that that's, that's particularly striking when you reflect on the fact that, that his chief uh, strategist, Dominic Cummings, had been recommending that people read books and articles about networks and as part of his drive to revitalize Whitehall, the British civil service. He too is now uh, seriously ill with COVID-19. Uh, I think those guys just needed another 12 months, maybe 24, before having to deal with a crisis like this. But HR is entirely right. And, and, I, want to, and I want to be optimistic too and, and cheer for America. Uh, we have this ability to fix things. And, and one thing I notice going on, I, I read uh, many of my sort of left-wing and liberal friends who are shocked, shocked to find out how completely incompetent the uh, administrative parts of the federal government are. Some of them sound like they're turning into conservatives at this point. Um, <clears throat> you know, America comes to every war late and then we finally gear up and win it. We, we do the right thing after we've tried everything else. Uh, and, uh, and I think there is this capacity, if, if we understand as a nation, which I think we are learning out of this, 
that those federal bureaucracies need cleaning up. And that, that's not a new, that's a, been a Hoover idea, you know. <laughs> I think we say that three times every time we get together for coffee. Uh, I think the, the deregulatory, fixed regulatory effort that's been going on under the radar screen in this administration was a, a response to the understanding of, of how dysfunctional much of it had become. Uh, that may be, uh, that, that process of fixing the country uh, once, we've, once we as a country see that there was a real problem uh, may, may be underway. We have that capacity slowly but surely to fix things. Yep. Inshallah, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, we are just to take this international now again. I mean, I, Bill's question was about what, how does this play into the competition with the Chinese Communist Party? And, and again, I'm, maybe I'm unrealistically optimistic, but I'm optimistic about this as well. Right. I mean, I think it's clear now that China has been profoundly dishonest uh, to, to its own people and to the world in, in this crisis. I don't think, you know, a plane load of medical supplies to, to Italy that is actually orders of magnitude less than the support Italy did get from, from the European Union, fellow, fellow European Union countries, is going to sway Italian opinion or to convince the Italian people that the Chinese closed authoritarian model is more appealing than, than, than uh, our free and open democratic model and free market economy. I think, Neil, you may want to comment on this. I mean, I think that, that the, the role of the Chinese Communist Party uh, in, in, this, in this crisis has created, I think, blowback within the United Kingdom as well. I mean, there are many prominent politicians who were willing to let the Chinese Communist Party wheel in the Trojan horse, you know, of Huawei, uh, you know, uh, backbone uh, and, and, uh, and infrastructure for, for f- fifth generation communications that, that are walking back o- on that now. So I, I think, you know, out of, you know, don't, don't let a crisis go to waste. Uh, I think there, there is an opportunity to compete more effectively with China, to, to pull the curtain back on the on the real motivations and the nature of the Chinese Communist Party, draw that contrast and foster the kind of international cooperation we need. Cooperation between strong sovereign states who respect the sovereignty of their citizens, uh, as as well as as their neighbors and, and like minded countries. HR, my my column this week in the Sunday Times in London and the Boston Globe was on precisely the subject. I asked six nasty questions that. Uh, that Xi Jinping has yet to answer, uh, starting with what actually happened in Wuhan. Let's get the truth and and ending with how many people really have died in China of COVID-19. So I think it's true that uh, there's uh, some serious uh, discussion to be had about our future relationship and indeed uh, the relationships of other democracies with the People's Republic of China. Supply chains that rely heavily on China uh, for for pharmaceuticals are an obvious uh, object of, of concern for for the future, and I I think when we touched on this last week when we spoke, that the the sense that the relationship can never really be the same again uh, is is quite widespread not only not only in the United States but I think also in in the UK and in much of Europe. But the Chinese are playing uh, a better than average game when it comes to turning the narrative. Uh, from it's all our fault to we are the redeemers, we are the saviors. I think Chinese soft power is a, is a good deal more effective than it was even, even five or 10 years ago. So we shouldn't take it for granted that the world is going to conclude from this disaster that China was the problem. Uh, if the Chinese keep telling us that actually China's the solution, I, I think we at Hoover really have to push back against this notion, which was where our conversation began today, that the real lesson is that democracies can't cope with crises like pandemics. Uh, uh, uh. The real lesson is that an authoritarian state, which is ultimately as deceitful and secretive as the Soviet Union, is very likely to cause disasters like pandemics. And we need to keep ramming home the message uh, that uh, COVID-19 is to Xi Jinping what Chernobyl was to Mikhail Gorbachev and the Soviet Union, uh, an indicator of just how rotten the system was. Mm -hmm. And maybe we should be... uh demanding um, international inspectors to wet markets. What in the world are they doing? Uh, you know, an international monitoring of diseases. Uh, or, or, that, the, or the institution in Wuhan, 
that was conducting research uh, on uh, animal uh, transported viruses, which is more likely where this breakout originated. This one, but um, you know, most of the other ones are 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 animals that shouldn't be pinned together, being pinned together. Uh, people eating animals they shouldn't be eating. Um, just sort of basic public health measures, and not just in China, throughout you know large parts of the third world. Ebola didn't escape from a lab. Ebola escaped from people eating monkeys. I just have a hunch, John, that if we give that job to the World Health Organization, they're not going to be doing it that strictly in China. Uh, that's exactly what happened. They, that, that's part of this degeneration of the international institutions, which we cannot put up with anymore. I mean, part of becoming a little more attuned to our national interest is that we can't just ignore the fact that these international institutions have become ridiculously politicized and, and basically useless. Yeah, there, there's, there is no prize for membership you know, for, within an international organization, right? These are competitive spaces and China's become very effective at actually subverting the very purpose of, of these institutions as we saw with the World Health Organization. So I think this idea of, of competing you know, effectively uh, with China, who is actively promoting their authoritarian closed system, uh, is immensely important. And, but, but and do and what I, you want and put up a wall around it is not going to work. Right, exactly. And, and I think just to the point that, that John, that you've made and, and that Neil has made, is, is that look at really how these authoritarian closed systems have dealt with this. I mean, is, is, is Iran a model? I, I don't think so. Well, maybe North Korea is, right? Because Kim Jong-un has said there's not even one case. There's, no, there's not even one case of coronavirus in, in North Korea, which is, of right. course, well, of if, course. If you admit to having it, they take you out and shoot you, which is very bad for people uh, admitting that they have a fever in North Korea. Gentlemen, we're getting short on time, so let me ask you a question, and let's get a quick response from the three of you, and that would be this. Six months from now, let's say, we return to normal and we can get on airplanes again and the president of the United States can travel and the president of the United States can invite people to Washington DC if he so chooses. What does he do with China and Xi Jinping? Does he go to Beijing and talk to him, talk to the Chinese leader about the pandemic? If he does have a conversation, besides asking the Neil Ferguson questions, does he offer carrots or does he offer sticks? Well, I don't think we're going to be back to normal in six months time. Yeah. And I think that uh, in particular, air transport is not going to be back to normal and uh, there will be a great, great many fewer state visits and other diplomatic interactions in, uh, in real space. Uh, uh, it may not be Zoom that they use, but it's going to be video conferencing uh, for, uh, for meetings between leaders, just as it's video conferencing for meetings between prime ministers and cabinet colleagues when, uh, when somebody contracts the disease. I think when they next speak, uh, and that can happen anytime, of course, uh, if it's done electronically, uh, it's important that uh, the president make clear his dis deep dissatisfaction with attempts by the Chinese foreign ministry to spread disinformation about the origins of the virus. That was one of the most shocking developments of, of last month, that that fake news story was officially sanctioned by the Chinese government. Uh, I think he, make, he must make very clear uh, that that was an intolerable uh, lapse. But then the next question really must be, uh, you need to give us a, a proper uh, account of, of what happened and, and what went wrong. There have been mistakes in every country, uh, and we began by talking about missteps that the US government has made. But clearly the most important missteps were the missteps that were made in China. And I think it's, it's not really going to be easy to do any kind of business with China in future until there's a transparent account uh, of what went wrong. We, we can't be fobbed off with the kind of whitewash that I suspect the Chinese have in mind. So that would be my message. Before we talk about anything else, tariffs or anything else, we need a full and, and frank account of what went wrong in, in Wuhan and why in particular, because for me, this is the killer question. Why did you cut off transport between Hubei province and the rest of China before you cut it off between Hubei province and the rest of the world? Maybe I'll go next and let the expert HR uh, follow up. I agree with Neil, six months from now, things will not be back to normal. And maybe that's a, a thinking about the world six months from now might be a good topic for us to explore next time. Um, I don't think cutting off is the right idea. I think, you know, China's sort of like the Soviet Union 1975. It got to where it can get with its current model and now it's in, in deep trouble and I, I think they kind of know it. The answer then is, is that you, you don't want to cut off, you want pressure. 
direct and indirect pressure. Yes, you either fly there or Zoom there and you meet them and you toast. And then you, as, as we give them pressure on human rights, uh, then you say, we have got to talk about your health system and transparency in your health system. If you care about the public health, <clears throat> you have to swallow hard and decouple the public health, the, the desire for economic competition, which we disagree on a little bit, and the obvious military and security issues. There's a great temptation to, to put these all together and fight one big fight with China. But if you care about achievements on the public health, on guys, you have to give us uh, you know, access to know what the real numbers are. We have to know what your health protocols are. We have to know what's going on here. You have to be willing to tolerate um, their misbehavior, uh, wanton misbehavior on other uh, items and to negotiate just about uh, transparency and health because biology does not know borders. And, um, you know, if, if we want to stop disease, it's going to be a while if we don't want to fight an actual war with China to unseat the regime. Uh, we have to let them sit until they stew in their own juices long enough but we can't let them just quietly produce viruses while we're doing it. So I, I say you engage and you, you focus on this health issue as a separate issue from the other ones rather than, uh, rather than uh, trying to tie them all together. HR, you get the last word. Okay, well, well I think it's, it's great to, to pursue what John has recommended is your cooperation on, on health, but it is gonna be difficult to separate that conversation from the very nature of the Chinese Communist Party and its base motivations which I think really are, are twofold. The first is to extend and tighten the party's grip on power internally. And the second is to realize their aspirations as described under the China dream or national rejuvenation. And this is what makes the party, I think, it, you know, hostile to our interests and unable to cooperate on, in this case, health security or in what the Obama administration pursued, right? Which is cooperation on, on climate change and global warming. So what do you get when you try to cooperate with the Chinese Communist Party on, on, on an issue, you know, like climate change, for example, you get an intensification of their campaign of industrial espionage. You get all uh, an intensification of all different forms of economic aggression. You get uh, reclamation and militarization efforts and, and a land grab, so to speak, in, in the South China Sea. You get, you get more threatening language on Taiwan and, 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 and threatening actions uh, directed at, at Taiwan. You get the perfection of their Orwellian police state internally, and you get the internment of a million people, you know, or at least a million people in concentration camps in, in Xinjiang. So I think it's important for us to pursue cooperation with China, but recognize, like President Obama did when he got, you know, from, from Xi Jinping, you know, the, Xi Jinping couldn't give a speech without saying the environment 19 times while they built 258 coal-fired plants, you know, and, uh, and, are, and are, are poisoning the earth with them. So I, I think it's, it's immensely important to go in with our eyes open. And an approach might be, as John, as you suggested, hey, just focus on cooperation in this one area, even as we compete with them in other areas. But another approach might be just that we all have to recognize China's not monolithic. And we have to figure out how to engage better with, with entities and people in, in China who are not directly connected to the, to, the, to the abhorrent policies of the Chinese Communist Party. And I think what the president can do, right, what all American leaders can do, is to make clear, hey, this is not what China says it is. This is not an effort for us to keep China down. This is an effort by, by the United States and others to counter you know, the, these, these intolerable policies of the Chinese Communist Party. Okay, let's leave it there until next week. I imagine we'll come back and talk more about China. Uh, amazing how fast an hour goes by. Uh, I do have one last quiz question for the three of you. No need for a long answer. And the question is simply this. You all are very busy with work. Uh, some of you are living right now in very full houses. What have you thrown into your routine to have that moment of Zen to strike a balance between work and family and just keeping your head together. John Crockham, what have John Crockham, what have you what have you discovered? Oh, I'm still looking for that Zen. Most most of my Zen lives outdoors in activities that are now uh, forbidden. So uh, doing Zoom calls with you guys, working, eating and exercising, that's what I do. Uh, we're making sure. pretty comp pretty elaborate uh, meals these days, my wife and I. Okay. HR? 
<laughs> we have a great, great routine going in, in, our, in our house that is full. Thank goodness. We have two of our daughters, a son-in-law, and most importantly, I guess, our, our, our twin grandsons who are six months old, who are just a joy to be around. Neil Ferguson, you ooze of Zen. What, what have you discovered, my friend? When I uh, headed for the hills uh, just over three weeks ago, uh, as you know, I was uh, an early pessimist on the pandemic. And so I'm in Montana where there's still enough snow for skiing and my, my daily backcountry skiing, who needs lifts uh, anyway, uh, is really the key to keeping sane in all of this. I, I just, as I'm skiing, I just keep thinking to myself how lucky I am and thinking of all those people who are getting through this in cramped apartments uh, who can't get even to the local park. And so it's not really a Zen moment, it's an empathy moment. As Adam Smith said, the key to civil society is, is having that sympathy with your fellow citizens that isn't always in evidence in our society today. Thank you. John? That's, very, that's very strong in our house too. We're, we're incredibly lucky to live where we are, to have paychecks that are still coming, and that our problem is just how to schedule all the Zoom meetings uh, when so many people are really suffering both medically and economically right now. Yeah. Amen to that. John, H.R. Neal, thanks for a great conversation. We'll see you again here next week. Thank you. For this episode of Goodfellows, we hope you enjoyed the conversation with three of Hoover's best senior fellows, the Goodfellows. On the behalf of John Cochran, Neil Ferguson, and H.R. McMaster, everyone here at the Hoover Institution, we wish you the best. Stay safe, stay strong, stay healthy, and we'll do our best to help you stay informed. We'll see you next week.